Hey guys, in this week's episode, we are talking about The Green Knight. But before that, we're going to talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the novel, Annette, now on Amazon Prime, and the Siskel and Ebert podcast? I don't know. Join us! And welcome to the Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and sitting to my virtual left is Mike. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, also with me on my virtual right is Justin. How are you doing? I'm doing excellent. Thank you so much for asking. Awesome. All right. If this is your first time listening to our show, normally we like to start off every episode in a section called News on the March, where we talk about film and TV news or the movies and TV that we have been watching. Then we move into our feature review, and this week we will be discussing The Green Knight. Yep, and also here on the Casual Cinecast, every other week, or just about every other week, basically every other episode, we put out a Casually Criterion episode. And in these episodes, listeners get to choose a film from the Criterion Collection for us to review by voting in a poll that we put out on our Twitter account, so go check out our latest episode on Minding the Gap and lots of other Criterion Collection in our back catalog. And also look forward to our next Criterion episode, uh, which Mike is about to tell us who won the latest poll and what that movie will be. That's right. So our most recent poll was, uh, it was just Blind Spots, wasn't it? Yeah, right. yeah. Movies that each of us hadn't seen. Yeah, okay. That's why I wanted to make sure I got the theme right. Yeah. Uh, so I won. With the movie that I chose, and that was The Big Chill with 40%, which was like a last-minute addition because I realized the first movie I picked was actually reviewed by you guys before I joined the podcast. So, oops. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Then number two was Mirror, which I believe was Justin's choice. It was. So close. I know. And then uh, number three was Thief of Baghdad, which had 28%. uh, I I guess we'll never know what cinema is. I guess not. (laughs) True. Yeah, I guess not. Um, yeah. So, anyways, that was the poll. Yeah. Big chill. I've never seen it. Me neither. Hence the blind spot choice. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Uh, like we said before, you know, the poll is up on our Twitter account. If you want to go to our Twitter, it's at Casual Cinecast. Follow us there to be able to vote in the poll. Or I guess you can vote without following us, but it's probably much easier to see the poll if you follow us. That's how Twitter works. Indeed. <laughs> But yes, we also have uh, Facebook and Instagram accounts at Casual Cinecast as well. If you want to send us a movie suggestion, recommendation, you want to ask us questions about the movie we're reviewing, uh, topics to discuss, whatever, send messages to any of those social media accounts or to casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you like the show and you haven't done so already, go give us a five-star review or a eight-star review or however the platform that you listen to podcasts yeah. on uh, does reviews. The maximum amount you- of whatever. Yeah, just all the way, yeah. up to 11 if you're listening on a Spinal Tap podcast. That's right. <laughs> okay, uh, I think that's everything, right? I think we can just get into News on the March now? Yep, absolutely. All right, let's do it. News on the March! Okay, Chris... Do tell, what is this Siskel and Ebert podcast that you have in our show notes here? <laughs> yeah, I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah, I've heard of Siskel and Ebert too. There was actually, so there's this podcast I listen to called The Big Picture. And it's it's a really great podcast, actually. Um, however, one of the hosts like had a baby. And so he was out for a few weeks. What a loser. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> insane. Why would you have a baby in this world? Uh, yeah. Anyways, uh they and so in preparation, he knew he was going to have a baby. They produced this podcast that was basically like uh, the history of Siskel and Ebert, and they kind of start off, um, you know, as they first got together and like early life, and goes to basically a little bit after spoiler alert, Gene Siskel dies. Um, and it's an eight episode podcast. It's done kind of like in an NPR type style. That's what I would, uh, uh, you know, like one guy talking and telling the stories, and then there's like clips of. You know, like uh, Gene Siskel's wife talking about what it was like to live with them and the rivalry that happened between Siskel and Ebert. Um, and it was just really interesting. And it 
kind of really if you didn't already know it showed like how influential <laughs> Siskel and Ebert were in fact like in fact even with our podcast you know like uh, a bunch of guys talking and arguing about movies you know like um, just really influential on just the films and criticism and I highly recommend it uh, to anybody that you know has any interest in film criticism and the history of film criticism uh, I, I think it's a, a really interesting and well put together podcast uh, yeah and it's they're like half hour episodes so eight half hour episodes you listen to it while you're driving to work uh, and I, I think it's um I highly recommend it. So interesting. So they don't actually go over the movies that Siskel and Ebert covered and, and like kind of rehash it and talk about those in the form of a podcast. It's really just a more autobiographical about them. Correct. Yes. Uh, okay. They do talk about like <laughs> sometimes the movies that they got wrong. Like I think Siskel, I could be wrong about this, but he, he didn't like Apocalypse Now. He, uh, <laughs> And he got that one wrong, you know, like uh, it, it's interesting to go back through their old films, too. But they don't really stay on that topic for sure. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. They, they c- covered film for like 30 years, 30 plus years. So th- mm-hmm. there is um, a whole a lot of content that they uh, put together. Yeah, I think that's Ebert pretty was cool. Reviewing movies in like the 60s. Yeah. Uh, was until he. I you know, the last few years of his life, which I, th- I think he was as late as like the early 2010s. He was yeah, still 2012 doing 2012 is when he died. So, yeah. I yeah. Believe. I miss uh, Roger Ebert quite a bit. I used to follow him on Twitter. I used to read his reviews mm-hmm. every week for new movies. Even when I didn't agree with him, uh, I always found his reviews to mostly be pretty interesting and, and professional. There were some times where I think he got a little too big for his britches and did things that um, some critics would just be fired for. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, <laughs> But sometimes uh, my favorite thing that Ebert would always do is he would go back and sometimes revisit movies that he didn't like previously and reexamine them. And and sometimes he would give them a four star review after, you know, initially hating it. So, uh, yeah, I always I always enjoyed Roger Ebert. And I think Siskel died whenever I was kind of too young to really get much of an impression of him, you know, and it was like the pre social media age. So uh, it was hard to really get to feel like I I knew his style the same way I, I knew Ebert's, but I remember like when I was a little, little kid, like in the nineties, uh, staying up late to watch Siskel and Ebert at the movies. Nice. I never watched that. Like when it, it was, was fun. I mean, it was two nerds arguing about movies and they seemed pretty snooty about it, but it was still fun and they would get mad at each other sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen the clips, right. And, and those are fun. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, cool. That's a cool podcast recommendation, Chris. I'm always looking for new podcasts because I work from home, and so mm-hmm. 40 hours a week I'm just sitting in a room by myself on the computer, and uh, <laughs> this is exactly the kind of content I could probably digest pretty quickly. Yep, yeah. four hours uh, of work taken care of. Yeah. Have yeah. either of you guys read Ebert's Life Itself book? I haven't, I've but listened. I watched the documentary Life Itself, yeah. and it was it was rough, man. <laughs> yeah i've listened to parts of the book and then i have watched the documentary as well okay cool yeah, yeah. the documentary is a bit more focused on you know like his career and, and his like cancer that, yeah and that that side of things whereas like life itself really covers a lot more like there's very little that has to do with movie criticism and like there's very little talk of films in there and it's a, a lot of other stuff that like the document even the documentary like didn't really have time to get into um hmm. so i recommend it if you find like his life interesting and want more chris or mike yeah, or anybody absolutely. yeah cool well justin yeah. i think that leads us to our next topic which is something i think you have been reading oh yeah it does that that wasn't even like a planned segue but look at that we're yeah <laughs> into another book i jumped on the opportunity i love it <laughs> it's professional it doesn't work it's, as a segue if you call smooth. it out yeah. It does if we talk about how I jumped on the opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yes, uh, I, I finished a book over the weekend uh, that I've been reading for the last week or so. And um, it's uh, the, the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood novel, the Tarantino written one. Yeah, and, I'm on chapter three of this thing. Oh, nice. I think there's 23 of them. So only 20 more to go. Yeah, I'm almost there. 
Yeah. <laughs> You're um, three twenty thirds of the way there. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I kind of just wanted to talk about it just because I really enjoyed the novel a lot more than I expected to because it was a little different than I expected. So I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, and, I, and I think, too, would it be safe to say that I, I'm probably the one who liked Once Upon a Time in Hollywood the least? Uh, I, I don't know. I liked it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I didn't like it. Yeah, I don't know. I think it was certainly, I think it's in the upper half of Tarantino's filmography. So maybe, you know, I didn't love it, but I liked it more than anything he's made since Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. Well, then we're not that far off, maybe. Um, I guess I, I kind of felt like leaving whenever we did our episode on it. I felt like, OK, I like that less than anybody else. And that's kind of been my my attitude about it. But like, um not that that really matters, except that, you know, I wasn't particularly interested in this book <laughs> uh, because, you know, I kind of thought it was this, this straight up novelization of the film and it was just going to be like the film in book form. But I jumped at the opportunity to get it just because I needed to like come up with birthday gift ideas uh, <laughs> for my, my wife's parents where um, it was coming up to my birthday and they kept asking me, what do I want? What do I want? And I couldn't think of anything. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, how about this book? You know? That's like a nice, easy gift. And um, so I got it and I, and I started reading it. And uh, what I have what I ended up really enjoying about it was that it's very supplemental to the movie. And it doesn't necessarily follow the same story at all. Uh, not at all, but like it doesn't have the same like plot points and beats to it. And there, there are several like big scenes from the movie that aren't in the book. Um, when there is a big scene... Uh, from the movie that is in the book it's from another character in the scene's perspective or somebody like off from a distance Mm -hmm. and i I enjoyed how much it filled out the movie and like in turn made me think back on the movie more fondly or at least like the whole world more fondly in the characters because Mm -hmm. i got to know them a little bit more and that was surprising to me Yeah, uh, I'm only on chapter three, like I said, but uh, everything you're saying is the impression I got up to that point, right? Like, um, you have almost an entire chapter of Cliff Booth's character uh, just thinking about what movies he likes and doesn't like. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Right? And uh, this is, like, basically Tarantino's excuse to just write about all the old stories that he heard from, you know, people that he admired when he grew up. And I think he credits the people at the beginning of the book, like, thanks, Kurt Russell. Thanks, Robert Downey Sr., like a bunch of people like that. Yeah, maybe Burt Reynolds, too. Burt maybe Reynolds, yeah. And and then, yeah, so anyways, I found it pretty interesting, um, especially because, you know, early on in my movie watching days, I got really into spaghetti westerns and I got really into westerns and, and uh, movies from the 60s and 70s. And the, all that stuff is explored here, so... If you're even remotely familiar with like who Sergio Corbucci is, you know, uh, mm-hmm. this is probably a book that you will get something out of, I would imagine. Yeah, there's definitely like nerding out about old movie stuff um, that, you know, even though it's a fictional story about fictional characters, there's a lot of, you know, true knowledge in there and uh, true stuff peppered throughout that uh, it, it's pretty interesting from that perspective. But, you know, like you said, you, there's a lot more cliff booth like he feels like a fleshed out character that's you know brad pitt's character from the movie and sharon tate is really well fleshed out in the book um and you know she was pretty much my favorite part of the movie too but you know i i've always felt a little um you know uh didn't have as much screen time as i would have liked Mm -hmm. and so that was another thing you know i got a lot more of her in this and um you know a lot more of her, her story and yeah, I, I highly recommend it to anybody who liked it. And, and even if you weren't that hot in the movie and you just enjoyed it, felt like maybe it could have been better. I think this book might actually fill out some of those things that you might have been missing or that might have been missing or, or um, stones that were left unturned in the film that you would have liked to have seen. Because like, that's how I felt. Like, And it makes me like the whole thing more. Well, that's good. That's good to hear. Um, I haven't really ever gone back to watch Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but... 
I was talking to my dad about it the other day, and he was like, I really like that movie. And I was like, I haven't seen it since theaters, but like his reflection of it, because he grew up in the, you know, he was born in the 50s, so he grew up watching a lot of the uh, movies that it, it talks about in the book, a lot of the westerns and stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I think he was, he really dug the movie because he was kind of like remembering, <laughs> even though like you'll see cameos of celebrities playing like old movie stars and stuff like that, he kind of knew who they were supposed to be and he he was familiar yeah. with like the stuntman that Cliff Booth was based on, you know? <clears throat> and so, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've kind of wanted to go back and rewatch that movie because I think there may be more to it than even I took from the first time, you know? Because... I haven't really loved anything Tarantino has done since Inglorious Bastards. Like, I don't think he's made a, a straight up bad movie, but like some movies just don't leave me with like as good a taste in my mouth as uh, his early work did. You know, pre, two thousand tens. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. This will definitely go into all of those like TV Western things. That was the other thing I wanted to say too. Is that like uh, never have I wanted to go back and watch like old serial Western television <laughs> more than while reading this book. <laughs> yeah. Like I my dad up, was like, really into that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. he showed me a lot of like Bonanza growing up, like the Virginian stuff like that. Yeah. Virginian, uh, gun smoke, uh, the, the, the Steve McQueen show wanted dead or alive. Cause yeah. that seems like maybe like the most direct inspiration for bounty law. Yeah. Um, but Except yeah. uh, uh, Bounty Law, doesn't that take place like in, in a contemporary like 70s society? Oh, fiction, you might be right. I, the I fictional don't know. one. But but either way, same thing. You know, they make modern contemporary Westerns all the time. Yeah. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, I have it sitting on my uh, desk in my room right now, uh, but I haven't cracked it open yet. Uh, I, I, I'd definitely be interested in it. I've read some of the excerpts, like... a. Like about uh, Francis Truffaut. <laughs> uh, apparently, Cliff Booth did not like Francis Tru- Truffaut very much. Um, yeah, but uh, Francois Truffaut. Francois. Francois. I used to do the same thing, and then uh, someone in film school made fun of me one time. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I wish that was me, but it wasn't. No, it was Jake. <laughs> Ooh, that son of a gun! I know. <laughs> he made me feel dumb. He's like, I like how you call him Francis, and I was like, Oh shit, I do, don't I? <laughs> Well, that's I mispronounce remedy. things that I know I'm mispronouncing as I'm mispronouncing them. Um, <laughs> that's just your style. Like, yeah, I've heard it's Chris more of an accident when name. I pronounce it correctly. <laughs> 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 cool. Well, yeah, that that's it. Just a, a recommendation. You know, I know a lot of people really like that movie, and uh, you know, if cool. you were hesitant about the book like I was, well worth the time. Awesome. Yeah, I've uh, I've been interested in this ever since he's been talking about it. Like, I remember when Once Upon a Time in Hollywood came out, uh, he was talking about how he wanted to do, like, a novel of it. And even before the movie came out, he was talking about how he was working on something that he didn't know what it was going to be yet. He didn't know if it was going to be a movie or a miniseries or a book or whatever. And uh, he's been flirting with the idea of publishing books for a long time. So I'm interested to see, like, what he's capable of doing. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, on the page, you know. So uh, yeah. I will definitely check it out and continue reading past chapter three soon. Yeah. I would read a second <laughs> book about Rick and Cliff Booth, the, the Italian years. Because nice. there's that was maybe one of my biggest complaints about the movie. Our, our biggest things where I was like, man, I just wish we had more of the Italian years. And it wasn't like, you know, two lines of uh, voiceover, you know, <laughs> yeah. telling us about them. Uh, I, I wanted more and I still feel the same way. So like. Once upon a time in Italy, or once upon a time at, at uh, Cinecitta, Cinecitta, the novel would be great. I want that. All right, let's make it happen. Okay, yeah, put it out <laughs> okay, into the world. It. Maybe it'll happen. Um, all right, so I guess the last thing to talk about in news on the march is I watched a bizarre little film starring Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard and one of the guys from Big Bang Theory. Simon something another. Simon Helberg? Helberg, yes. Oh, I love that guy. Dude, I didn't in Big Bang Theory because I don't like that show and I didn't find anything charming, but he is so good in this movie. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He, when he's not this in... Movie, I mean, I like for, Big Bang okay, but when he's in other stuff, like, he absolutely kills his role in A Serious Man. I don't know if you remember that. 
I don't, but he, <laughs> he's the priest that he goes to see him and he's like, look at the parking lot. We all need to be more like the parking lot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that, but he's fucking hilarious in that. Okay. Well, interesting. Um, I didn't remember that was him, but I remember that scene. I haven't seen a serious man in quite a while. Um, but anyways, he's so much better in this movie than he is in Big Bang Theory. But this movie as a whole is it's just bonkers, man. I don't know what else to say. Like it's a, It's a musical... And the music was done by this band called Sparks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's which right. uh, I think Edgar Wright famously just made a documentary about Sparks recently and celebrating their wacky career. You know, they're kind of off center and really prolific and experimental and uh, just not mainstream at all, you know? Mm-hmm. And Double feature uh, anyway, idea. this documentary, or not documentary, this musical, sorry. Uh, it's just, I don't know how else to describe It's just weird, man. And some of the songs I like, some of them I don't think sound very good. But they're always pushing the story forward. And man, this movie just swings for the fences in a way that a lot of movies just simply do not, you know? Mm-hmm. Adam Driver sings. Uh, there's even, a, sing, uh, there's even a, a singing session he does at one point while uh, <laughs> going, uh, performing a certain act on Marion Cotillard, you know, <laughs> he sings yeah. into her. Um, it's just bizarre, man. And like the stuff that they do just like so bravely, like Marion Cotillard and Adam driver, it's just crazy. Uh, and they really go for it. And the last hour of this movie is a lot more interesting than the first 30 minutes. So if you start this movie and you think to yourself about 30 minutes <laughs> in, What the hell am I watching? I don't want to continue this. Do it anyway. I would say (laughs) keep pushing through because there are some really great scenes that I'll never forget. Even though I don't know that I come away from the movie loving it. I get sort of um, like Dancer in the Dark vibes from this. Ooh, I love Dancer in the Dark. I know you do. I know you do. Um, And that's a movie that I also like, but also don't. Like, and I I don't think it's a good musical. (laughs) And I don't think the songs are that good. And that's kind of how I feel about Annette. They work for what they are in the movie. But it's not something you could, like, listen to on its own. They're not super catchy. (laughs) Yeah, but there's, like, one song from Dancer in the Dark that I sometimes play on Spotify. But I've tried listening to the soundtrack, and it is, A, grating, and B, stressful, mostly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and that's what, I mean, this movie, I wouldn't say it's quite as, it, cause it's not Bjork music, but it's it's Sparks music, right? And so I don't know if yeah. any of you guys are familiar with Sparks, but no. um, it's just, it swings for the fences, man. And it's free on Amazon Prime, so I recommend this movie, although I wouldn't recommend it to everyone. You know, I would recommend it to people who are looking for something unique and and strange and... Yeah, I, yeah. I, I guess that's where I'll leave it. But it's wacky. Adam Driver's awesome. Uh, but I don't think that's news to anybody here. Not me. Yeah, he's usually <laughs> pretty good. Um, yeah, well, cool. Uh, I, I could have used more Marion Cotillard. She's not in the movie as much as you think she's going to be, which is a shame. Oh, wow. Cool. Well, I've been excited about this ever since I, the trailer came out. Um, and which I, I don't remember how long it came out. It was three or four months ago, I think. Yeah, a few months ago. Yeah, but I thought it looked uh, at least interesting. You know, if if it's not good, I know it's at least going to be unique. Yeah, so. I haven't really worked out on whether or not I think it's good. I mean, I do think it's good, but it, I don't know where it falls for me, right? Like, when I was watching it on Letterboxd, like, I was like, oh, I'm hovering at, like, two stars. And then when it was over, I was like, maybe two and a half is more fair. And then like a day later, I was like, two and a half is much too low for something that that unique and ballsy. So I, you know, I still am not completely sure where I would like rank it out of five. Yeah. Have you, have you seen Holy Motors? I I'll have not. Uh, I want to after seeing this movie, though. Okay, yeah. I've flirted with the idea of seeing Holy Motors a few times um, on Netflix, mm-hmm. but never pulled the trigger because it looked depressing and weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Is this a, an all singing musical or just they, they break into song? I would say it's not an all, all singing musical, but it, it kind of is at the same time. Okay. It's, it's not like Hamilton where it's like, there's no dialogue at all. Yeah. But it's, it's heavily stylized. Even when they're talking, they're talking to music. Gotcha. Okay. So anyways, I would like for you guys to check this movie out. Um, and get back to me on what you think or listeners if you've seen it also let me know what you think because i need someone to talk about this movie with <laughs> yeah. well i will take care of that for you as soon as i can <laughs> thank you you're welcome okay and i guess that is as good a time as any to go into the main review this week yeah i'm ready okay chris are you ready let's do this all right here we go. Green Knight coming up after this. Actually, should we do this in one year? One year hence, we should review the Green Knight. <laughs> we'll meet up again. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. then we'll edit out the whole transition of that year. We'll edit out the year for sure. Oh, greatest of kings. Let one of your knights try to land a blow against me. Indulge me in this game. I will be deep. Okay, so as always with our newer films, we will be doing a spoiler-free section up front. We'll be talking about our general thoughts and whether we liked or disliked the movie and, and very general general reasons uh, why we felt that way without giving any way, away any major details or spoilers. Uh, so if you have not seen The Green Knight yet, you can continue listening until we give you a warning and play our bumper for a spoiler alert, which will give you plenty of time to pause the podcast, come back, and finish listening to uh, the rest of our discussion on the green Knight. that's right if you have any honor that is <laughs> yeah you'll come back one year hence you should come back <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm that's the last time i make that joke i promise it's a good joke though solid joke it gets funnier every time yeah it's still funny so <laughs> <laughs> anyways okay. all right who wants to get us so. started talking about the green Knight first well actually hang on let me do my little Thing. I skipped something. So The Green Knight was directed by David Lowry. <laughs> it stars Dev Patel, Alicia Vikander, Joel Edgerton, and Sean Harris. The IMDb synopsis says, A fantasy retelling of the medieval story of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. That's the truest synopsis I've ever heard. Yeah. Succinct and accurate. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, now who wants to get us started on who goes first? I vote Chris. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, man, you remember when um, <laughs> I kept choosing uh, that movie? What was the name of the movie with uh, a- a- Garfield in it? Um, not Garfield, the cat, but Andrew Garfield. <laughs> Under the Silver Lake. <laughs> Under the Silver Lake. Um. I, when I did that and we made the jokes about movies getting pushed back in that one movie, I ne- I, little did I realize that that was going to become our life. Yeah, the new <laughs> norm. waited for movies to come out during the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and Green Knight uh, certainly fits that because it kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And I was looking forward to it like before the pandemic started, right? Mm. Um and I guess the question is, like, did it live up to my expectations um, during that time? And I think it does. In fact, I don't think. I know it does. Um, Dev Patel is uh, pretty excellent, um, but his hair is even better. Uh, we kind of talked about that in a previous podcast, <laughs> but um, Dev Patel is really great in this. Uh, I love how uh, the one complaint I hear about this is that it's it can be slow or, you know, like it's not action packed or there's not even very much action in it even at that right uh but i found it like hypnotizing or like diving into like a like a tone poem or 
however you want to describe it, it was beautiful. Uh, the music is great. Uh, I, I can't say how, like, it, it's <laughs> remarkably beautiful. Um, and I don't know how much CGI went into this. Uh, there's probably quite a bit. Apparently but... the Green Knight himself, there's no CGI involved in him at all. Right, which is pretty awesome. Um, Agreed. And, yeah, I... I Really enjoyed this movie, and the fact you know that we had to wait so long for it kind of actually increased my enjoyment. I think because it it lived up to my expectations of it, and probably exceeded it to, to some extent. Um, uh, I, there's probably more that I want to get into uh, in spoilers, but for now, I'm going to pass it off to Justin, and because I, I know I think where Mike is, but I, I'm excited to hear what Justin has to say about the Green Knight. Yeah, sure. So I was also, you know, very excited about this movie. I think it was on my most anticipated when we did the episode, like way back, whatever year it was that this was supposed to come out. (laughs) Um, If it wasn't, it was on my short list uh, because I like David Lowry a lot. Uh, uh, Ghost Story is one of my favorite films that year that uh, that one came out. I really enjoyed Old Man and the Gun. I I went back to watch uh, Ain't Them Body Saints and... Peach Dragon, which are, uh, you know, both films that while not necessarily like the greatest films, I really enjoyed them. They're very beautiful. They have like a wonderful aesthetic to them. And and I think yeah, particularly a ghost story uh, tone poem is kind of the, the word that you use, Chris. And I think that that perfectly describes like that film where there's like very little plot and more about tone and aesthetic and mood. And I think Green Knight is kind of the the bridge between a ghost story and some of his other regular films. Peach Dragon. Where, <laughs> Peach Dragon, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that's a pretty literal one <laughs> almost. Um, but yes, uh, Green Knight's kind of in, in between there. And uh, I really I really just love his style. Like It just works for me. It, it sucks me in. I love living in the mood of his films because what he does so well to me is boil his films down to mood and theme versus plot and entertainment, you know, like someone might do with the story of uh, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight or mm-hmm. like someone might do with uh, Peach Dragon. And, you know, <laughs> what he said too, Chris, about people complaining that it was slow you know, that's 100% what I expected from Green Knight. And this is probably the, you know, annoyingly pretentious uh, movie watcher in me or, you know, film watcher, cinephile, whatever you want to call it. But when I heard a lot of people complaining that it was slow, I got really excited about it. <laughs> 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 like, I, I know that's pretentious and like, you know, snooty to say, but I was like, ooh, yes, this is... I, confirmed this is going to be the film that I thought it was going to be from David right. Lowry. Yeah. And um, so I just really loved it. Everything you said, Chris, it's beautiful. Dev Patel is great in it. All the performances are really good. Um, the, the caveat that I have to say uh, about this is that I don't really like fantasy stuff that much. Like, or I find it really hard to get into, you know, like I, I couldn't necessarily get into game of Thrones. There's been like, you know, fantasy medieval type books that I've tried to read book series. And I can't, I just can't get into them. There's two of like books that I've quit in like the first like 150 pages because I just, I just couldn't get into them. So it, it's just the one thing that like, I think keeps me from loving this movie is just my lack of like inherent interest in the story. But that said, this is probably my favorite like fantasy medieval Arthurian thing that I've ever consumed. (laughs) So, uh, you know, I kind of say that to caveat, like if I don't say like, I love this film, that's the reason why, but also to explain that even though I don't like those things, uh, you know, I really enjoy this film a lot (laughs) and it's easily the best uh, of what I've seen of those things. Right. Sure. Although I would argue that it's not even medieval fantasy that you don't like. I think it's just costume dramas in general like this, because I remember like whenever the what was that movie that with the about Anne Boleyn starring Natalie Portman, oh, the, the other Boleyn girl. Yeah. 
I remember you complaining back even then. You just don't like like medieval costume drama, or not even medieval yeah. like costume drama, like, like Elizabethan. Yeah, whatever. Like you just don't. You're not. That's just not your cup of tea. And I think it's funny that all these years later, like over a decade, you still haven't managed to get over that hump. <laughs> I try, man, and you know, it just. Man, it's I difficult. get it. I don't like sports movies. I think they're all pretty boring. Exactly. We all have our things yeah. or are, are, are not things. Indeed. You know. Indeed. But yeah, okay. Uh that that's pretty much it in terms of like general thoughts. It's beautiful. It's it's good movie to just live in and enjoy the mood regardless of what happens in it. Uh so I'll pass it off to Mike. Awesome. Yeah, so I can definitely confirm this was one of my most anticipated films uh, whenever we, whatever year that was. Everything <laughs> blends together <laughs> now. Anymore. I think and, it was supposed to be 2020. Yeah, I think yeah. so. We probably did the episode in 2019. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, it's been a minute and I have been looking forward to this movie. I also I really enjoyed David Lowry. I have not seen Ain't Them Body Saints, but uh, Justin, you did convince me to watch A Ghost Story. Uh, mm-hmm. And the other stuff I think I've just kind of saw naturally but um yeah i've always really really enjoyed david lowry uh i like him more so when he goes into the a ghost story you know tone poem type stuff and that is exactly what this movie is um you know the the story is 700 years old at this point in time uh i wasn't super familiar with it but i kind of knew of it you know, I kind of knew of Sir Gawain because, like, my dad showed me Excalibur when I was a kid and, and stuff like that. But I'm not the most versed in Arthurian legend. Um, mm-hmm. This is probably my favorite thing I've seen of, like, the Arthurian tales, you know. And I think because it holds true to what the poem is, right, which is a, a morality tale. And it doesn't need to be anything else. It doesn't try to be anything else, you know? And it kind of leaves you scratching your head a little bit if you're not super familiar with the text, you know? I think they give you enough here to, to piece it all together. But it may take more than one watch. Um, I think, like you guys said, Dev Patel is awesome. Sean Harris as Arthur is awesome. And um, a way that I've never seen King Arthur portrayed as the kind of old and and fragile. Mm -hmm. Sickly almost. Yeah. And yeah, Joel Edgerton is great in this. And I think most of anything, uh, playing two roles here is Alicia Vikander, who has this really, really great dialogue, uh, monologue later in the movie about the color green. (laughs) Yeah. Which I just think is, is a wonderful scene. So yeah, this whole movie, you know, it's, it's sort of about, this night that just, you know, is he ever going to get his shit together and find honor or not, you know? And then, and then he proceeds to go on this adventure, you know, and it's pretty fascinating. I didn't really know what was going to happen. And then, you know, maybe if you see the end, you still don't quite know what happens, but maybe you do. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I loved it. I think it's great. It's one of my favorite, it's definitely my favorite film of the year so far. I, can't imagine everything being pushed back and all that, that anything better than this is going to come, come into my life and top it over the next few months, but we'll see. We'll see. But, yeah. uh, yeah, uh, I guess that's my initial opening thoughts and I guess we can just get into it. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to talk too much about the film without getting, you know, spoilery. Yeah. But, I think I was thinking about this uh, earlier today and particularly there's a scene where uh, Sir Gawain is walking out of like the forest into a field and there's a battle that's happened. Um, yeah. And it's kind of foggy and there's, there's a kid running around talking to him. Um, and, and I was trying to remember how often the movie feels like this, but I was reminded thinking back on the scene of, um, of the film that we recently talked about on the, on the show, uh, Mike, uh, uh, come and see. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way that that camera kind of floats and there's a lot of like, you know, 
the camera moves like through a whole scene in like one single take and it floats and um, there's kind of like devastation around. But um, I felt come and see a lot. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting because, you know, we we view Arthur as like a hero king, you know, and a noble man. And, and he's portrayed as a noble man for the most part in the movie, uh, especially when you're in Camelot, I guess, is what the city, you know, that's Camelot, I guess. And all the scenes at the round table and all that stuff, you know, we're like, ah, oh, Sean Harris is a noble, honorable Arthur. But then as soon as Sir Gawain gets out of Camelot, uh, he is firsthand witnessing the the destruction that the Crusades and what Arthur's knights have wrought upon the land. Mm-hmm. And you're right. It, the camera does sort of just float there and the carnage is all sort of in the background and having already taken place, you know? Mm-hmm. We just sort of inhabit this world that is post battle, post war, and you see firsthand kind of the destruction and harm that they're causing to the everyman, right? Which mm-hmm. kind of leads you to believe, like, is he even, is this quest to become honorable, is this even really being honorable at all, you know? But that's still what knights do, so that's what he does, you know? Yeah. And I think it's go on. Well, I was going to say, you know, the the sort of like post battleness of this. And I and I don't think this is particularly spoilery because it is a 700-year-old tale, but you know, he's traveling to meet this green knight and I I find it interesting that he's going to find honor but he doesn't get it through like battle like he's walking through this area that's already been (laughs) ravaged yeah you know uh, and i guess that's something that that's something that i appreciate about this story right is that it's not necessarily the knight going into battle and becoming a a legend in that way well exactly i mean he he has multiple tests throughout the movie right like um, a knight's supposed to be generous and uh, courteous and, and all there's like there's like five things that a knight's supposed to be right and he he's presented with all of them throughout the movie mm-hmm. and doesn't do well with them at all <laughs> to the point to where it's like <laughs> this guy's just not an honorable dude he's kind of a shitty guy a crappy person and doesn't really deserve to be a knight and you know I can get more into that into in spoilers but I think it's interesting that yeah, the, this is the way he he can achieve honor, right? Like this is the way. It's and it's going to just keep your word, right? And that's how he he can achieve honor, because the peasants and uh, tests that he encounters on the road, he doesn't always handle with the the grace that a knight should, you know. Right. Even down to the beginning of the movie, right? Like there, I think the first opening scene of the movie is you see a house burning or a building burning over the walls. And mm-hmm. then you see this brave man kiss his wife or girlfriend or, or his lady goodbye. And he rides off to go help. And then the camera keeps on zooming out into the brothel. And that's where we see Sir Gawain sleeping. <laughs> Not being particularly honorable or brave <laughs> or doing anything of of note you know i think he's sleeping (laughs) yeah he's sleeping and then he's fornicating right away and then he goes home to see his mom you know and and i think it's interesting because you know watching the movie i guess if you if you pick up on any arthurian legend you realize his mom is morgan le fay and his mom is the one that sent the green knight yeah right and so I guess it's sort of like a an Arthurian way of like how to get your son to stop being a piece of shit. <laughs> Helicopter parenting. <laughs> yeah. Get him out there <laughs> to make something of his life. I don't you know, I don't know, but uh it's it's pretty fascinating and it's really moody and I and I really enjoy it quite a bit. Um but yeah, it it is hard to talk about this movie without spoiling things, so I'm ready to get into that whenever you guys are. Agreed. Yeah. Let's let's go. Let's do that. Okay, so Looks like we all recommend it. Um, if you've seen the movie, keep on listening. All right, here we go. Oh, I guess Rosebud is just a piece in a jigsaw puzzle. 
Give me one of those cigarettes you got up here. I'll tell you all about it. Things are going to start happening to me now. And here we go. So, kind of continuing where we were with like the beginning of the film, you know, we do get that opening with him. And I think him stepping up to challenge the Green Knight is is i guess uh, i want to say that you know oh he's like doing the uh honorable thing and like you know jumping forward to fight this thing um but i i think what i felt was the most fascinating thing to me like thematically about the film was just why he's doing what he's doing right like mm-hmm. he's stepping up to the green knight to gain honor because there's the scene with him and Arthur and, and Arthur, I think Arthur asks him, you know, look around, who, like, what do you see around with all these people, all these knights? And he says, you know, heroes and legends or something like that. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think, you know, even up until the very last scene of the movie, he's aspiring to that right. versus aspiring to be honorable. Right. He's also, I didn't, Arthur at the beginning asks him to tell him his, a story, you know, about his like exploits essentially. Right. And he's like, I don't have any stories. And so he's kind of going out looking for a story so that he can tell Arthur his story. Right. Um, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, he's, he's looking for a chance to impress the big dogs, right? He's invited yeah. to the, to the, the main event, right? The round table. He's sitting in Lancelot's chair and Arthur mm-hmm. is like, regale me of a tale, you know? And he's like, I have no tales to tell. And then, and then Guinevere is like, yet. And right. then, you know, it's almost like his mom just kind of planned it out. You know, it's it's this was like a, literally an event designed to give him the chance to step up and, and tell his tale. Or yeah. Create a tale. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the things, you know, uh, I was a little confused on. Was whether or not. You know, she sent the Green Knight and. It just so happened that her son stepped up and she didn't yeah. necessarily intend that to happen. I think she did. Okay. I think she did not intend for him to chop off the Green Knight's yeah. head. Yeah, that's him uh. being dishonorable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, he could have just nicked the guy or, I don't know. I mean, like when a dude's sitting there kneeling and presenting his head to you, <laughs> I wouldn't think your first instinct should be to chop it off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, like yeah. that Arthur's like uh you do understand the rules like right before he goes to fight him, right? And then he chops off his head anyways and you're like you don't understand the rules at all, do you? <laughs> yeah. So, it's it's I don't know. I thought that was pretty fascinating and like j- to answer what Justin said, I don't know that it's so much to be honorable, but he wants to be a knight. He wants to be yeah. up there with the greats and to do that you have to have that certain knight's honor, you know, that, that the knights of the round table are kind of, that's their thing. Yeah. And that's so right. I also like, think indirectly he, it, he needs to, to achieve honor to get there, you know? Yeah. And he's exploring like, what is honor? You know, like what is the honorable thing to do? You right. Know, uh, throughout and, and, a lot of And he movie. fails that test multiple times. Like I said, yeah. like he doesn't give the peasant a coin or he gives yeah. him one coin and it should have been more. He wasn't generous enough. And then when he goes to the the to the ghost's lady to find her head in the water, he he asks what he'll get in return. Right. Yeah. You know, and then uh, what else? You know, he, he flinches whenever he goes to, like, ask for a ride from the giants. And the giants are like, Ur. and then he's like, whoa, never mind. <laughs> you know, and he doesn't tell Joel Edgerton what he received. And then, obviously, the last thing that that drives him to shame and and to run away from the the lady and the lord with the sash. Mm-hmm. So, oh, yeah. basically, he doesn't do anything honorable successfully. Mm-hmm. No. He doesn't act as the one knight should up until yeah. the end of the movie. Whenever he he kind of envisions what his life would be like without honor, without. Uh- yeah, yeah. I really like the um, conversation he has with Joel Edgerton. I think it's right before the the green monologue from Alicia Vikander, um, and he's like, 
Joel Edgerton asked him something like, well, what are you doing? He's like, I'm looking for honor. He's like, are you asking me? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, he doesn't even know what he's doing, really. He's just kind of like wandering and trying to figure out his life, essentially, you know. Yeah. Uh, so I, like, I, I, that conversation really kind of spells it out. But I, I I like that conversation a lot. Yeah, me too. I think Joel Edgerton is really good in this movie. Mm hmm. Uh, the other thing I, I want to bring up, and maybe we're skipping some stuff, but man, that last sequence, um, like where he's imagining himself going back, right? Or, yeah. or depending on how you interpret it. But that last sequence, uh, on the level of like the beginning of Up, you know, like you, you just, there's no words. It's basically a silent film and it's so well done. Like it's it's worth watching the movie just for that sequence, you know, it, it's, it's very, it's very last temptation of Christ. Oh, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's hard not to think about that, but yeah. just as a sequence anyway. Yeah. It's just, oh, I, I just, the things that can be portrayed without using any words, uh, is pretty amazing. And I, I really enjoyed it. The, the show don't tell aspect of it. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the like the whole sash thing. Uh, it's a you know I guess the the point the the theme being, you know what what is a life lived um, in fear, right? Or what is a life lived if you don't have to be afraid? Is maybe a better way to put it, right? Because that sash is like protecting him. Well, right. Well, it's 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 cheating at his game. Yeah. What is a what is a life when you haven't lived it honestly? Like, like when you're when you're basically the only reason you're there is because you did a very dishonorable thing by cheating at the game that you agreed to. What kind of person does that make you? What kind of ruler would that make you? What kind of life would that be? Yeah. Yeah, and then and then yeah, that's why I think so. Let me ask you guys, do you what do you think happens at the end? Uh I would assume that the Green Knight cuts his head off and he dies. Yeah. You think so? I mean, is, that's kind of how I read it. I, at first, I read it as No, I mean, maybe because he did that he won't die. I, and I don't know why I thought that. Maybe it's cuz his mom kind of set the whole thing up. But then we've passed the test by taking it off. So the green knight's not going to cut off his head essentially. Yeah. R- right. Yeah. Like he, he did something, he did the right thing, but then I realized, well, his mom didn't ask him to cut that knight's head off. He could have just nicked the guy. All he needed to do was go back and have the same blow returned. And so I think the blow is returned and I think he does lose his head. Yeah. yeah. To me, that's I, the game. Right. And it's also, it's like, it's kind of about accepting the consequences of your actions right. too, you know, and yep. not trying to get out of it. Yep. Um, and I, I think without him getting his head cut off, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. It means to you what it, because it's so ambiguous. It, you take what you want to mean from it, but I, I feel like if he doesn't get his head cut off, that's, it's, it's kind of missing the point to a certain extent. You know, like right. Accept the consequences of your actions, and, and if you don't, like it can eat at you. You know, you know, that's the whole sequence. He goes back and he feels shame because he wasn't honorable. You know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so it eats at you and it can corrupt you and turn you into something else. Uh, And so I I feel like uh, and certainly there's like a aspect of it where he maybe he didn't get his head cut off or whatever. But I feel like he got his head cut off. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it turns if that were to happen, like, let's just say hypothetically, the movie went on and the Green Knight was like. Okay, I see that you're not afraid and you're ready to be do the honorable thing. And since you're ready to be actually honorable, regardless of the consequences, I'm going to let you off. That is pretty dissatisfying. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the right decision was made either way to cut off and cut the black. Yes. Because yeah, equally, yeah. I don't necessarily want to see him get his head cut off. Like, I don't know yeah. if that would have been... He finally made the right decision and he gets killed for it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I think it's there? better left unsaid. In my opinion. Um, yeah, because, uh, I mean, if the point of the movie is do the right thing and be honorable and, and own up to your your actions, like, 
you that's where it ends right <laughs> once he yep. does that and, and to go on and show you know something like that i think i don't know how tonally that would feel it feels like it would um almost show something negative yeah, for him I doing agree. the right thing right i agree so i think it's interesting that you know the second time i watched it i think it became very very obvious that his mom kind of orchestrated the whole thing um mm-hmm. because she walks in the same like direction like it, it, the scene whenever arthur is giving the speech walking around the round table his mom is moving in the same similar direction wherever she's at you know in a circular motion a lot of the imagery lines up and then whenever he wakes up uh and he's at the manor before he sees joel edgerton he sees his mom talking to him and his mom has the blindfold on and then the old lady that's in the house with Alicia Vikander, whenever, you know, in his bedroom, whenever she <laughs> brings him shame by, you know, making him uh, finish on the sash, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. a blindfolded lady is there watching in the background, you know? And so that's like <laughs> definitely the same imagery that Morgan Le Fay had earlier in the movie. So it's just like she's watching him this whole journey, trying to provide him. Like he loses all his stuff at the beginning. And then slowly she keeps implementing these tests to give him back the things he lost, like his horse, his sash, his axe, you know? Mm -hmm. The voice of the fox sounds very similar to Morgan Le Fay's voice. Um, So I I feel like the fox is even uh, her, and that's why she tries to keep him from going. Right, because Morgan Le Fay sort of represents the pre-Christian, you know, sort of like paganism, Mm -hmm. natural way of things and not necessarily the, the godly way of things. So, right. yeah, the Green Knight the, himself seems very influenced by nature. So there, there is a reading to this story, too, where he just dies at the very beginning of the movie, like uh, when all his stuff is stolen from him uh, because it has that long pan around and then it's just a mm-hmm. skeleton. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So there is a reading of this movie also where he's just like in purgatory. And in order to get to heaven or to move on, you know, he has to make do the honorable thing finally. So I, I guess that's uh, a better reading of it, maybe like where he gets his head cut off or not. Maybe a better. It makes you feel better. But like he gets <laughs> head, head cut off and he can pass on to the next life or the next whatever is after death. Right. 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 After purgatory. Yeah. That's, that's I like interesting. that. Yeah. yeah, I like that, too. Uh, you know, I, I kind of took it, you know, on one viewing of this you know, setting up the the ending of we're going to envision what happens from here. You know, yeah. if I go through with like, you know, however, whatever my current situation is in that case, if I don't do anything and I lay here handcuffed. Yeah, I know, guess that's true, too. Yeah. It's kind of a precursor to that vision that he has at the end. But uh, I like the other way maybe better. I don't know. Yeah. Either way, it's a movie that provides a lot of layers and things to kind of unpeel and and really dive into and as you guys know i i really like coming away from movies that sort of make you want to do like the book report thing and like really put in the legwork to (laughs) to watch it and think about it and you know Mm -hmm. and really analyze it like that's the kind of movie that i i get off on so i wish more movies were like this (laughs) uh a second viewing really uh on on peels back the layers a little bit because you can watch other Mm -hmm. things you know like um a second viewing is definitely um enjoyable is what i would say like i I actually got to so i took my cousin the second time to see it he's like a doctorate in history so he he also really enjoyed it but like uh that that second time's just ties the whole movie together yeah yeah yeah, I agree. I, I've seen it twice, too, and I, I enjoyed it both times, but the second time it was just like, oh, hmm, okay. A lot of that. Yeah, yeah. I think a second viewing would um, help pay attention to those things because there is a bit of first-time viewing being in awe of the visuals and kind of taking mm-hmm. in the story and the plot. And while, you know, I, I praise David Lowry uh, f- certainly for being able to – uh boil down a story to its themes and its moods and its tone. I, I think there's still an element, especially with the, you know, the things going on in this film of like, 
that plot's still there. And I don't think you can really dive into all that other stuff maybe as deep without a second viewing. So, Yeah, once you have your bearings yeah. and you know where you're going. Yeah. 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 All, the, all the, the razzle-dazzle what there is there in this movie, which visually there's a lot. <laughs> um, is, I agree. You've experienced it, you know. I think one of my favorite – I have two like little bits throughout the movie that I still think about all the time. And one is like whenever he finally gets to the green chapel and he sits there and he waits for Christmas. So for the night to wake up. And then once he does like right before his, his, his vision or his, his whatever, his dream about what life would be like if he doesn't go through with this, he's like, is this all there is? And the green Knight's like, what else ought there be? And, (laughs) I don't know. To me, I really love that because it's this, you know, when you're young, you think, well, one day this and like when I get older, this and this is what life will be like and I'll be happy. And I'll, who knows all the things I'll do, you know? And then when you're faced with the idea that they, this is the end of your life, you know, and is this all there is? Is this everything that I could have done and, and am, you know, that I'm doing now? And this kind of idea of like, you know, life is there to lose. That's what we do. We live and we die eventually, you know, and when you do it and how you do it is really what matters. And uh, I don't know. I thought that was kind of succinct and poignant at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that I really liked was Alicia Vikander's speech on green. It's like, you know, like green is like rot and we'll cut it out. You know, green is what's left when the lust fades and all this stuff about green and I just think it's really awesome that she plays both roles that like the, you know, the, the common prostitute that he loves. And then this fictional lady that is like this almost something he could actually have, you know, like appropriate in society. He could marry her. He could be seen with her in public. Mm-hmm. And so it's like his mom is throwing like the perfect curveballs at him to, to test his honor. And I thought yeah. that was pretty cool. I think I think she's really great in the movie. Yeah, Alicia Vikander is really good in the in the movie. Um, Joel Edgerton also sort of has two roles. He like his face is in the Green Knight uh, towards the end, and I, I'm not exactly sure what they're trying to say with that. Well, exactly. I think multiple characters' faces are are with the Green Knight. Is it more than just Joel Edgerton? Yeah, but in the in the original poem, Joel Edgerton's character was the Green Knight. Like it's just revealed, and then Morgan Le Fay's like, "Haha, I'm behind this the whole time." <laughs> uh, but in the movie, I think he keeps it a little bit more vague because it's not just his face. I think you see a few faces. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's interesting. I, I think the moment, it's not necessarily like a story beat, uh, but it's the moment with the giants where you, when you first see the giants and it's like a giant hand reach over the, the mountain mm-hmm. and then he asks for a ride and there's just like the, Wind is blowing his beautiful hair, and the the fox howls and to protect him. And we get you a him, Dev you know. Patel wig. Yeah. yeah, I do need a Dev Patel wig. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, but yes, <laughs> that it's just such a beautiful moment with the fox and everything. I, I think that that's really great. Yeah, frame that, put it on my wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think if anything, you know, encapsulates his visual style and the the way that he shoots things in the the color palette and like contrast and, and like beautiful, like sort of dreamlike mood that his films have visually. It's that scene Mm -hmm. where he's seeing the giants. Uh, And also I I think I could do my hair like Dev Patel in this movie. Yeah. I think you probably could. I haven't seen you in a while, Justin, but uh, recently I saw a couple of Facebook posts and this has nothing to do with anything, but like, man, your hair is beautiful. Almost as beautiful as Dev Patel's. Goodness, Uh, Chris. For those that don't know, Justin's hair has gotten really long. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Well, uh, you know, he has a a Hollywood, albeit like an indie Hollywood crew keeping his hair and makeup on point. I don't have that. I have um, just you. I I have hair product. I can buy it like Ulta and Target. (laughs) working for me you know and no professionals well, working. <laughs> you should trim your uh beard and mustache to the to match his beard and mustache in this movie too 
That's what you should be as good at Halloween. Right? <laughs> Ooh, that's Sir actually a, a, a really good idea. <laughs> All right. I'm writing that down somewhere. Okay. I mean, I'll write it oh, down later. Real quick, before we end this thing, because I'm running out of things to talk about, but yeah, uh, I but really, really enjoyed the crowns they use. Like King Arthur's crown and then the crown that he eventually wears in his yeah. his vision. Where it looks like those old medieval paintings where there's like a halo behind them. Yeah, yeah. He has that. The, the glow, the, the ordained by God sort of glow. That, yeah, they look so cool. Yeah. I've never seen a crown like that in a movie before. I'm not sure, sure if I have either. It's it's pretty awesome. I, I liked it quite a bit. Yeah. And, well, you know, we were supposed to do this episode last week and we had to postpone. You know, so I watched the movie a little over a week ago. And I maybe watched the trailer like one time. And without having to go look up a visual when you said, I like the crowns, I could immediately picture it. Yeah. Right. And I've only mm-hmm. seen it once. And, um, I don't know. They, they are it's striking. striking. Yeah, I agree. Uh, do we have anything else we want to talk about? Nope. Go I watch it. It's great. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's short. I don't think it seems short. It's, it's like less than two hours, right? Yeah. Uh, actually, I do, I do have a question. Do you think that this film is enhanced by reading the story first, like if if you were going to recommend this movie to somebody, would you say no? Like, haven't read the story. Yeah. From from my understanding, I haven't read the story either. But like I've listened to people talk about having read the story, that it's it's pretty different from the original story. Okay. Um, so like it, you, you probably would get a a, a better understanding. Uh, I, but I don't know that it'd be. Well, it's different. Friend of the show. Uh, Mike from Cinemusts, uh, I talked to him about uh, how excited I was for this movie whenever I was on his show recently, and he was saying that he actually uh, teaches this regularly to his students. Mm. That would have been a good opportunity to have him on the podcast. I know. Uh, but anyway, he was <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I imagine they'll have to change something because the last half of that poem, virtually nothing happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I'm putting, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I'm paraphrasing. But anyway, he yeah, was yeah, saying yeah. that he hadn't seen the movie yet. The movie wasn't out yet when we had that conversation. But he said that he would imagine it would probably have to be different for it to even yeah. work as a movie. Uh, even one as artsy as this. Yeah. So this movie is two hours and ten minutes. And it doesn't feel like two hours and ten minutes. No. Because it, it is slow, but I never, I never felt the slowness of it. You know, like, uh, I... I I guess I don't necessarily see that complaint. I guess I can understand why people would have it, but I, I was, I, it doesn't feel like a two hour and 10 minute movie. It doesn't feel long to me, but I definitely understand how people would have that complaint. Um, this yeah. is definitely not, like I said earlier, this is not a movie I could recommend to everyone. Yeah. Like well, my think- dad watched Excalibur and he likes Excalibur a lot, but I don't think my dad would like this movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that, you know, a lot happens in this movie, but none of it is action based. Like the most action in the movie is, uh, Sir Gawain slicing off his head, you know, and maybe him like crawling, trying to break free of like when he's tied up in the forest. Right. And that's it. And maybe there's just a different perception of what a film called the green Knight That's an Arthurian legend in medieval story about knights or yeah, a what knight. you're expecting. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there's just expectation there. And when you're, you're waiting for something to happen, like a, like an action scene, a battle, that's where it comes from, you know? And, you know, as we noted earlier, the biggest, like bloodiest thing that happens is a, a field after a battle and everyone's already dead. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. nothing's really happening. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Now, now I'm done for sure. Okay, cool. So, uh, I guess that's that's it then, right? We're done. Yeah, that that is. Uh, thanks for talking about the Green Knight with me, Mike and Chris. It was a lot of fun. You're welcome, sir. Awesome, and let's thank you. Do it again next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Let's do the big <laughs> chill next week. That sounds good. An idea <laughs> I just came up with. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> but yes, uh, thank you, listener too, for listening. Also, thanks, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. Um, if you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at soundcloud.com slash bopscotch. And uh, if you want to time travel back to when we were in college together, you can hear him make fun of Mike 
for saying Francis Truffaut. Yep. The same Jake. Uh, Relive (laughs) my shame. Um, All right. Stay tuned to this channel. Subscribe, all that stuff. Our next episode, as I just said earlier, will be a casually criterion over the big chill. So see you then. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next time. One year hence, we'll see you. Yeah. One year (laughs) hence. Thank you.